The other Russia story breaking tonight reveals a Trump-linked businessman pitching a business deal that would put Trump allegedly in the White House with Putin's help. For months now, the news about Donald Trump and his ties to Russia has dominated the media all over the world. Did Trump work together with the Kremlin to win the election? The Russia story is a total fabrication. We didn't win because of Russia. We won because of you. That I can tell you. Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller, who is leading the Russia investigation, has now also focused his attention on the president's business deals. Hello, Mr. Saylor. In our earlier episode on Trump, we already came across connections with the Russian mafia, as well as cash flows from Kazakhstan. Could you answer any questions on money laundering or Krapunov? Following up from that first episode, we now continue our investigation of Trump's business friends. We work together closely with reputable reporters in the U.S. and Eastern Europe. Seder was a direct line between Trump and property deals in Russia. We find indication of Trump's business partners and former employees being involved in money laundering practices. Theft, embezzlement, fraud, money laundering. Supposedly, millions of dollars are involved, stolen and laundered through an ingenious network of hundreds of mailbox companies also through the Netherlands. There's an unusual number of Dutch connections here. How does this billion dollar fraud affect the president of the United States? Zembla again investigates Donald Trump's controversial friends. This is CNN Breaking News. The president of the United States has terminated the director of the FBI, James Comey. In May, Donald Trump fires James Comey, director of the FBI. According to Comey, this is because he refuses to stop the criminal investigation of Trump's Russian ties. But that step does not end well for Trump. The Department of Justice appoints a special counsel, Robert Mueller. Mueller takes over the Russia investigation. He's looking at a bunch of, a lot of Russian money, Russian investors who bought properties in Trump buildings in New York and elsewhere over a multi-year period. In New York, we meet James Henry, lawyer and economic investigator. He publishes items on Donald Trump's business interests, interests that special prosecutor Mueller is now investigating as well. He's been moving from simply looking at the rigging of the 2016 election into issues like financial crimes, which uh, Trump you know, is, is very concerned uh, that he not wander off into because there's a whole Pandora's box. We also schedule an appointment with the lawyer Ken McCallion, who has extensive experience in money laundering and fraud investigations. In the 1980s, when McCallion was a prosecutor for the Department of Justice, he already investigated Trump. I worked on an investigation of organized crime infiltration into the building trades in New York and actually Trump Tower, whereby Donald Trump and other developers could buy labor peace in return for making corrupt deals. McCallion, too, expects that the investigation of Trump's business empire by special prosecutor Mueller will bring financial crimes to light. Yes, many developers were hesitant to rely so fully on, you know, bags of cash and suspect sourced funds uh, from Russia. Trump made it a central cornerstone of his investment strategy. I think if he's going to look at any project that may have involved uh, dodgy money, Trump Soho would be a good place to start. Trump Soho in Manhattan, 46 floors of luxury apartments. Trump widely advertises the building in his television show, The Apprentice. Soho, here it is. The Trump International Hotel and Tower in Soho is the site of my latest development with world-class accommodations and panoramic views. In our first episode, we showed you how Trump Soho is a project of cooperation between the Trump Organization and another company, Bayrock. Under U.S. law, as one of the shareholders, Trump could be liable for any business decisions. But who are the people behind Bayrock? 
Internal emails of the company show that one of the owners is a Mr. Felix Sater. He will turn out to be the key figure in our investigation. Who is Felix Sater? He was born in Russia in 1966, uh, came to Brooklyn in the 1970s with his father, who was uh, named Mikhail Shefirovsky, changed his name to Sater, and was called by the FBI a uh, syndicate crime boss for Simeon Mogilevich's uh, uh, Moscow organized crime family. Felix Sater's father is a mafia boss who works for one of the most infamous Russian criminals, who is suspected of numerous killings, Semyon Mogilevich. So that was Felix's father. In 1991, uh, Felix was convicted of stabbing somebody with a, a uh, margarita glass in a bar fight. After the stabbing, Felix Sater is arrested and put behind bars for a year. And then he becomes involved in financial fraud and he has a $40 million scheme in pumping penny stocks. Fraud and deception. Felix Sater works together with a group of criminals with ties to the mafia, artificially driving up the value of shares by providing false information. Again, Sater is arrested, but then something strange happens. He is basically on the verge of pleading guilty uh, to those offenses, but he does a deal. Sater cuts a deal. He becomes a government informant, turning on his accomplices. Supposedly, this has landed dozens of criminals behind bars. In exchange for the information, Sater himself stays out of jail. In fact, the American government covers up the court transcripts about the fraud. Shortly thereafter, in 2002, Sater suddenly reappears in the real estate company of Bayrock. In an interview with a Russian magazine, he says, I became a managing director of Bayrock. We had an office at Trump Tower, one floor below Trump's. He was really a key player uh, in, through Bayrock in the Trump organization. As at that point, the court transcripts about Sater's fraud are sealed, Trump and Sater can simply move on to business as usual. Banks and investors in Bayrock do not find out anything about Sater's criminal past. But according to James Henry, keeping that past a secret is a crime. He was a twice convicted felon who had been involved in a $40 million financial fraud. Not the kind of pe person you usually want to sign up to to be building real estate deals with. Did Trump know about that? If, that, if he knew about it and concealed it or failed to tell his, uh, his other investors or the banks, that would be a concealment fraud. A former Bayrock employee testifies that Sater threatened him with violence to prevent him from revealing Sater's past. As we heard one of the lawyers involved say in our first episode, he said, yeah, many times Sater threatened to kill me. He threatened to stab me in the throat. If I ever talked, he threatened people all over the place at Bayrock if they ever talked. As we can see, Sater has a history of threatening violence. An investor in a Bayrock project accuses the company of embezzlement. The case is settled, but the man testifies under oath that Sater has threatened to administer electric shocks to his genitals, to cut off his legs, and to leave his dead body in the trunk of his car. Sater denies these accusations. In 2007, Felix Sater goes into business with a rich family from Kazakhstan, the Krapunovs. Viktor Krapunov is the former mayor of Almaty, a major city. According to the Kazakh government, Krapunov has stolen $300 million worth of public funds. He basically sends his whole family to Geneva, uh, along with uh, estimates are, you know, at least uh, $300 million and a whole lot of real estate properties. Krapunov himself claims that the family assets have been earned fair and square. We don't know exactly what deals were made between Sater and Krapunov behind the scenes. 
But we do find out that in 2007, Krapunov sets up a mailbox company in Amsterdam. At the same time, Sater also sets up a company in the Netherlands, Bayrock BV. And then there was an overarching company, and that's where the money went, Casbe. Casbe was just a conduit. Bayrock denies any money laundering through Casbe. In our first episode, we went to see Felix Sater. What does he know about the money laundering practices and about the Krapunov family? Hello, Mr. Sater. I'm a Dutch journalist, um, and I'm doing a report on um, Bayrock. We came across some companies in the Netherlands. Okay, which companies in the Netherlands? Bayrock BV and Casbah you have BV. You send me an email uh, to me and my attorney. Hold on, I'll give you the email address. Yes. And you can send me all your questions. Okay, I wait. Could you answer any questions on money laundering or Krapunov? I don't know about money laundering, but you could ask any question you want in writing. Yeah. CC my attorney, and will be more than happy to respond to any written questions. Okay. But Felix Sater has stopped answering our questions. We contact him again, but Sater lets us know that he felt our first episode was false and libelous, and that he doesn't want to talk to us again. President Trump had a warning for special counsel Robert Mueller. Investigating his finances and his family's finances would cross a red line. Donald Trump is furious in his reaction to the investigation by Prosecutor Mueller of his business deals. What does Trump know about Sater's past and his possible involvement in money laundering practices anyway? According to Felix Sater, the two have been in close contact for years. But Donald Trump acts as if he hardly even knows Sater. That becomes clear when he has to give a statement under oath in a lawsuit about a real estate project. About how many times have you have you conversed with Mr. Sater? In, in over the years? Over the years, if you could ask. Not me. many. Not many. If he were sitting in the room right now, I, I really wouldn't know what he looked like. Okay. Uh, that was a lie. I mean, Mr. Trump. Uh, whether he's under oath or not under oath, it doesn't make too much difference to him. Trump's amnesia is indeed remarkable. After leaving Bayrock, Sater becomes an advisor to Trump. He is given a business card from Trump's company, a telephone number, and an office close to Trump's own. In fact, it was very attractive to Trump that Sater had connections with Russian money. Trump denies having any business interests in Russia. I own nothing in Russia. I have no loans in Russia. I don't have any deals in Russia. But in August, Sater makes the headlines. The New York Times publishes emails showing that until 2016, that is until Donald Trump's presidential campaign, Sater was in the process of building a Trump Tower in Moscow. Sater wrote to Trump's lawyer. I will get Putin on this program and we will get Donald elected. Buddy, our boy can become president of the USA and we can engineer it. The Moscow deal eventually falls through, but according to Ken McCallion, an important conclusion can be drawn. Felix Sater has continued to play a role and a conduit between Russia and the Trump Organization. Other reporters also investigate Felix Sater and the business deals with the Krapunovs. We decide to join forces with the investigative team of McClatchy, a news organization in the United States that publishes 30 local newspapers reaching an audience of 65 million Americans. The other thing that's important to remember about Sater and Trump, Trump is a very private person in a unique way. He doesn't pal around with a lot of people. The, the McClatchy team is led by Kevin Hall. His publications on the Panama Papers win him a Pulitzer Prize. Hall now focuses mainly on the investigation of the Krapunovs, Felix Sater, and Donald Trump. A lot of the transactions 
the places where money came from, the way properties were sold. Many of these things have the hallmarks of lo money laundering, and I think that's why people are taking a look at it. This is like a puzzle, and you're trying to put all the pieces together. It's designed deliberately to not be obvious and to obfuscate. We also work together with OCCRP, an international organization of journalists that investigates corruption and money laundering. The OCCRP has an extensive network in the countries of the former Soviet Union. Looking at uh, Krapanov, you know, who allegedly stole fortunes uh, from Kazakhstan, this is very much our area of focus. And uh, they use an extremely uh, complex web of, uh, of, of companies in many jurisdictions. And this is exactly where having this collaborative approach of journalists from all over the place really works in trying to track this down. This is Elvira, daughter of Viktor Krapanov. She owns a toy and children's clothing store in Los Angeles. In court records, we can see that she used to be the owner of several expensive houses in California. What are the most important things that we need to find out now? In 2016, reports turn up that Elvira has bought three apartments in Trump Soho. To find out if any stolen Kazakhstan cash has been used to do so, we follow the money. We go back to April 4th, 2013, Cyprus. We see a transfer of $5 million to an American bank account in Elvira's name by a company named Crownway Limited. This is the account in Cyprus. Yeah. This is the account for Cyprus. So we need someone, you know. To look into. And I don't know account. how you do that. It is unclear who is behind Crownway, the company that transfers the $5 million from Cyprus. A year later, documents from the U.S. Treasury Department show that the Cyprus-based bank transferring the money is involved in money laundering and terrorist financing. As in many cases, what we know is concerning, we don't have the full story and we continue to dig on that. If you can find that this is money that came from this fraud in Kazakhstan and was laundered through this network of company, then what that is, is, is stolen money ending up in a Trump building. Money is said to have been stolen from Kazakhstan. That money could have ended up with Donald Trump. In New York, we talk to the lawyer who was hired by Kazakhstan to recover the $300 million allegedly embezzled by Krapanov. How did he do that? Like any good money launderer, and these guys are good money launderers, through uh, a variety of means. Um, so through the use of shell companies in various different jurisdictions um, that are difficult to obtain information about, through sham transaction documents, uh, loans, trusts, and things like that, all designed to move stolen money into the legitimate financial system and get it back out again as purportedly clean. The Krapanovs are said to have used dozens of mailbox companies to divert money. We get to see a list from the Kazakh Ministry of Justice. It names several Dutch companies, including Bayrock BV and Kasbay BV in Amsterdam, companies that we had come across earlier and we also see Crownway Limited. But how do we know if this information from Kazakhstan is reliable? Kazakhstan is itself a dictatorship. The country doesn't have a reputation for, uh, you know, independent judiciary, the rule of law, uh, the kind of free press that we like to take for granted in the West. I don't think anybody takes what the Kazakhs say at face value. Some of it may be true, but you can't just assume it is. I think you look for corroborating evidence, you look for more backup, you try to get the underlying source documents, yeah. Krapunov's son Ilyas is supposedly one of the main players, or so we hear as our investigation progresses. Ilyas is said to manage the million dollar fortune from Geneva, where the Krapunovs have fled to. Certainly Ilyas Krapunov plays a pivotal role in the laundering of funds throughout the world. We've talked with Ilias. Uh, he's a very engaging person, 
Uh, he's very bright. That much is clear. We learned that Ilyas Krapunov has been in business with Bayrock and Felix Sater since as early as 2008. A former Bayrock employee provides us with recordings of a discussion among managers of the company about a deal between Bayrock and Krapunov. I know the documents. Are okay, who's on? That's another good question. Because Krapunov said that they own it. All of a sudden, they had a partner, and they had to buy the partner out. Yes. And I, I heard all these stories, but I never got the documents to show anything. So I have that, no idea. That, that's what I'm thinking. Now, now, Krapunov, back to in his son, back to us. Hey, don't worry, we can't buy you out. You want to we pay your whole money, and I know why because it's a, it's a very good uh, uh, deal. We try to get in touch with Ilyas Krapanov in Switzerland because we want to know how he feels about these accusations. Hello, is this uh, Mr. Krapanov? But Ilyas Krapanov refuses to talk to us. In an email, his spokesperson writes that the Krapanov family have been falsely accused by the Kazakh regime calling it a political witch hunt. Several lawsuits are pending against the Krapanovs, but none have been decided on yet. The Krapanovs say that, in their business dealings, they have always complied with Swiss law. He comes off with a story of being a politically persecuted victim, that his family is a victim, and he's caught in the mix of this. Ilyas and his wife do, however, grant an interview on Swiss television. Les Krapunov sont tombés en disgrâce, surtout depuis qu'Ilias a épousé Madina, la fille du principal opposant à la dictature kazakh, le milliardaire Abiazov, réfugié à Londres. It seems that the marriage between Ilias and Madina is crucial. Madina is the daughter of a Kazakh fugitive, Mukhtar Abiazov, a former bank manager who has been convicted of stealing billions of dollars. Abiazov is said to work together with the Krapunovs. According to Kazakhstan, Ilyas Krapanov is also involved in the laundering of the billions of his father-in-law, Abliazov. Mr. Abliazov and Mr. Krapanov are related by marriage, and their stolen funds were mixed together and laundered throughout the world. Ilyas repeatedly denies managing his father-in-law's stolen billions. In an American lawsuit, we come across a witness. He testifies under oath that Ilyas has allegedly been trying to hide cash flows and investments of his own family and of Abliazov. We have an appointment with a Kazakhstan expert, Alexander Cooley, a professor at Columbia University in New York, who has investigated the Abliazov case. Mukhtar Abliazov um, is a fascinating figure for a couple of reasons. Uh, for uh, the Kazakh government, he is essentially Kazakhstan's most wanted. He is uh, someone who has embezzled billions of dollars through his BTA bank. He's a fugitive from justice. Uh, he uh, presents himself um, as a regime opponent um, to uh, camouflage some of these dealings. But for Abliasov himself and for many of his supporters, uh, he is a pro-democratic champion. Abliasov was the president of the board of BTA, the largest bank in Kazakhstan. In 2009, he flees to London in a rush. He leaves the bank on the verge of bankruptcy. Billions of dollars are missing. Mr. Abliasov embezzled billions and billions of dollars from the bank through the use of uh, sham loans to companies that were controlled by Mr. Avliazov or his associates. So the bank lent money to those companies who never repaid them. Avliazov himself denies all of the accusations. He claims to be a victim of a political witch hunt by the Kazakh regime, supposedly because he is an important leader of the opposition but according to BTA Bank, Abliazov has stolen billions of dollars by providing loans to companies that he himself secretly owned. He never repaid the loans. 
the money was diverted through mailbox companies. Abliasov himself um, has admitted to camouflaging uh, some of the origins of some of his holdings in order to uh, conceal them from Kazakh regulators and the president himself. The long list of Abliazov's mailbox companies also feature some Dutch companies. Notably, Abliazov works together with one of the largest Dutch trust offices, Equity Trust in Rotterdam. Up to 2009, that firm managed several mailbox companies for Abliazov. Trust offices ensure that the actual identity of the owner can stay hidden. Voor de buitenwereld blijft dat geheim om de oorsprong van het vermogen uh, te verhullen. Kees Schaap spent years as a public prosecutor investigating fraud and white collar criminals. These days, he has his own forensic investigation office. We submit Abliazov's Dutch mailbox companies to him. De enige motivatie daarvoor kan zijn, ik zou geen andere weten in ieder geval, is het verhullen van het geldspoor. Het knippen en verhullen van een geldspoor. En dat heeft alle uiterlijke schijn van witwassen. That's how we find this business, KT Asia Investments Group, a company to which Abliazov contributes shares in BTA Bank. Half a billion dollars worth of shares. Abliazov has hidden BTA shares in all kinds of places. So, without anyone knowing it, he suddenly owned 75% of the bank. Het is typisch weer zo'n transactie om zeg maar, het spoor van dat eigendom, hè, de herkomst van het eigendom van die aandelen van die bank, te verhullen. Another Dutch firm, Chrysopa Holding. Another one of Abliazov's companies. Chrysopa gets a $120 million loan from BTA Bank. The money is then diverted to Cyprus. The loan is never repaid. The man behind the Cyprus-based company is none other than Abliazov himself. That is a transaction with the kenmerken of a white transaction. Uiteindelijk het verhullen van de herkomst van het vermogen door het stapelen van transacties via verschillende vennootschappen en dus verschillende bankrekeningen en door verschillende landen. The mailbox company Chrysopa was managed by the trust office of Equity Trust in Rotterdam. According to Schaap, that office should have sounded the alarm. Transactions such as Abliazov's are suspicious and, according to the law, must be reported. This transaction is typisch a transaction that gemeld zou moeten worden by the uh, FIU in Nederland, the Financial Intelligence Unit, as an unreliable transaction. We haven't been able to find any report of the suspicious transactions. The trust office refuses to say if it has always complied with the law in these matters. Abliazov says he cannot answer any questions about his Dutch firms. The Netherlands is uh, um, absolutely centrally involved in a lot of these transactions. Do you think the Dutch government should pay attention to this? Absolutely. The Dutch government should pay much more attention to uh, investigating and possibly regulating what happens from these companies with Dutch jurisdiction. A civil court in the UK finds for BTA Bank on important points. Abliazov is ordered to repay billions. According to Abliazov, the British lawsuit has been manipulated. In the documents, we find over 700 companies that are said to have been used to embezzle and launder money. This simply makes it sort of a spider web, and that makes it awfully difficult for law enforcement to track it down because it's very labor intensive to pile through all of these companies and try to identify who the ultimate owners are. Abliazov is sentenced to 22 months in prison for keeping part of his stolen billions from the court in the UK. But right before he goes to jail, he flees to France. He hides out in the south of France for over a year, where he avoids justice, until July 2013. The fugitive opposition politician and former Kazakh banker Mukhtar Abliazov has been arrested in southern France. Abliazov is put behind bars. Russia and Ukraine request his extradition, but that leads to lengthy legal proceedings. Eventually, three years later, 
the highest court in France rules he cannot be extradited. Abliazov is set free. But where have the billions from Kazakhstan gone? There are indications saying that part of the money has been diverted to the United States. Former Donald Trump employees and business partners are said to have been involved, but there is no hard evidence. We don't know definitively that it was Ablyazov. We'd have to know that, we'd have to know through some other way that Ablyazov was doing it. Our colleagues from McClatchy and OCCRP are investigating real estate transactions from 2013 by a company that is supposedly run by Ablyazov's son-in-law, Ilyas Krapunov. The company named Triadu, which had been tied to the Krapunovs, was involved in these deals. And it was created uh, in order for Ilyas Krapunov to invest these stolen funds in the United States. Those are certainly our allegations. A former Triadu manager testifies under oath, saying that Avliazov is the one behind the scenes deciding on the tens of millions that are invested in real estate. There were a number of purchases that they were involved in. The McClatchy investigative team discovers something remarkable. Ilyas Krapunov is working together with someone we already know, Felix Sater, Donald Trump's business partner who earlier also did business with the Krapunovs. Would you answer any questions on money laundering or Krapunov? I don't know about money laundering. It's pretty clear that Felix Sater continued to work with uh, a number of companies that were tied to the Krapunov family. Felix Sater, former Bayrock manager, used to work for the Krapunovs, and he's not alone. We also find another employee of Bayrock and the Trump Organization, Daniel Ridloff. And Daniel Ridloff and Felix Sater both worked with the Krapunovs. The records now show that. So there's two people with the Bayrock and Trump Organization past working for the Krapunovs. Right, so at least two. Daniel Ridloff worked for Bayrock for five years. After that, he joined Donald Trump's company, what does he know about the Krapunovs and their alleged money laundering practices? Ridloff doesn't want to talk to us. He's spoken to the reporter Gabriel Paluch several times. She's a special correspondent for both McClatchy and Zembla. We join her on a visit to the office where Ridloff is currently working. I was hoping to speak to Mr. Daniel Ridloff. One moment, please. Thanks so much. This is the mailbox, sir. Daniel Ridloff. Please leave your message after the tone. A few days later, our luck changes. After we've waited for an hour, Ridloff finally comes out. I just have a couple questions I wanted to ask you. You mentioned last time that you knew that you were working with Ilias Krapunov, but did you know the vast money laundering and embezzlement scheme? We just wanted to get a couple questions in with you, and you don't take my call. Ridloff doesn't want to discuss his work for Ilyas Krapunov. It seems that the connection with the millions from Kazakhstan is meant to be kept a secret. Felix Sater is acting secretively as well. These are images of an auction where he bids on a building that Krapunov wants to invest in. Sater tries to hide his face, and he runs off the minute a local camera crew comes near him. Why would you do that? Good question. He has not answered that question to us, but clearly he didn't want his face shown, and by doing that, he drew more attention to the matter, not less, only to, to give even further concern that maybe something was untoward here. Felix Sater lets us know that all the accusations against him are false. We also contact the lawyer with whom Sater and Ridloff worked together in real estate transactions for Ilyas Krapunov. What is this regarding? I wanted to talk to you about a couple of deals you worked on for the Krapunov family. And, and who are you with? I'm with McClatchy and Zembla. Hey, here's the thing. You know, there's so much litigation going on, so many investigations going on, that I'm really not at liberty to share much. That there's lawsuits against the Krapunovs and Felix's and 
paper all the time, so there's just, there's just way too much going on right now. And I don't want to interfere with any investigations that are happening, so... Presumably you were aware that Elias Krapunov was um, providing money for these deals. So we would like to know... He hung up on you. He hung up on me. While Sater and Ridloff are investing millions in American real estate for Ilya Skrapinov, $5 million are transferred from Cyprus to Elvira, Ilya's sister. Elvira uses the money to buy three luxury apartments in Trump Soho, the building in which, at that point, Donald Trump holds shares. We know for a fact that Ridloff was involved indirectly with Elvira's purchase of the Trump Soho condos. So we know there's that connection as well. The purchase contracts show that Elvira soon resells the apartments in Trump Soho. They're buying and selling real quickly. And that's why people like the Almaty government are alleging money laundering, because that is one of the hallmarks of money laundering. For now, it remains unclear who has transferred the money from Cyprus. So, we are getting really close, but we have yet to find conclusive evidence that criminal money has been laundered in real estate owned by Donald Trump. You have at least the implication that uh, Donald Trump and his Trump organization knew or should have known, given all of these various connections. But that's, uh, you know, that's what, exactly what Mueller is getting paid uh, to, to investigate right now.